We have come a hell of a long way since the original man himself, Dr. Harrison Martland, in 1928 coined the term punch drunk syndrome. Since then, the science has developed our understanding of brain injuries tremendously, although I don't think it's been quite fast enough. The statistics that I'm about to distill down for you are really quite alarming. First, we'll take a look at CTE on a broader level and see where the numbers of CTE in the combat sports stacks up to more traditional sports. And second, we'll dive even deeper into the numbers specifically in the combat sports and attempt to stratify them based off of their correlation with CTE. And just to quickly mention, I spent a lot of time gathering this information. I did my best to link all the articles in the description, so if you find value in this video, please consider subscribing as I really like to make more videos for you guys. Let's get into it. So where exactly do combat sports stack up in comparison to other traditional sports? This was a really tough question to answer since some of the studies kept including the same sports over and over again, and many of them used different experimental designs. So the way I'm going to do this is in the form of a list. I'm going to start with the least amount of statistics or research linking that sport to CTE. Then we'll start to move our way up from there and talk about some of the sports that have the highest correlations of CTE. So to start the list will be the largely non-contact sports like tennis, volleyball, swimming, etc. As you may expect, this research was damn near impossible to find. And if there was research on it, there was a case report or an anecdotal report here and there. It's really hard to put a percentage on it since there's really just a lack of research. But the incidence is likely very low and really unlikely to have a correlation at this point. The next is the biggest category encompassing the most sports like soccer, wrestling, judo, ice hockey, baseball, basketball, wrestling, etc. And while there aren't many high quality studies establishing a correlation with really any of these sports, there is enough research out there to put it at least slightly above the previous sports, but much lower than the obviously high contact sports. Now, these sports obviously involve contact, but the goal of these sports is not to attack the head specifically. And now for the high contact sports like rugby, American football, and MMA or boxing. I think it pays to say up front that these sports have received the most attention and is one of the reasons why we have so much data on them. For American football, there's so much data given its high visibility and popularity in the media. And rugby's rugged nature, gritty culture, and lack of head protection leads to its susceptibility. And in our world, MMA and boxing, the entire goal is to incapacitate your opponent in some way. It's been observed that participation in American football, particularly past the high school level, was associated with markedly increased odds of CTE pathology. Also, in a TED talk by Dr. Emma McSweeney, where she was reviewing the current state of the literature on CTE in 2022, the cases of CTE that were confirmed post-mortem were 10 times more likely to have played American football for at least 14 and a half years. And with every additional year, the odds of having CTE went up by 30%. And children who played football under the age of 12 grew up to have decreased learning capabilities when compared to those who started after their 12th birthday. And 20% of people recorded to have CTE post-mortem never had one recorded concussion. NFL players receive on average in one season 1,000 to 1,500 sub-concussive impacts. And in rugby leagues, the numbers on sub-concussive impacts are even higher. Associations with CTE in American football players have been as high as 87% in some cohorts. That is incredible. And when we move on to MMA and boxing, there's just so much we have to try to make sense of. For example, in one of the largest cohorts ever examined in athletes and non-athletes, 28% of cases with confirmed CTE occurred in boxers alone. Not to mention a longitudinal study of 239 participants can consisting of 104 boxers and 135 MMA fighters, showed increased longitudinal and transverse diffusivity in white matter and subcortical gray matter the longer they participated in their respective sports, which are areas that have often atrophied in brains that have been confirmed with CTE post-mortem. Now that longitudinal study doesn't necessarily mean that those individuals will be diagnosed with CTE after life. But like I stated in my previous video, since the correlation's already been made with the amount of sub-concussive blows and the likelihood of developing CTE, I thought that study was worth noting. And possibly the most alarming statistics of them all is just how many sub-concussive blows fighters take. I did a little investigating and did some math on my own. If we just take a look at the UFC, for example, UFCstats.com has a wonderful database of pretty much any statistic that you could ask for. So I took the top 10 fighters of all time, specifically regarding significant strikes landed, and I added all of them together for a total of 18,542 landed throughout their careers. Now, significant strike is defined as all strikes at distance and power strikes in the clinch and on the ground. And I wanted to be certain that I didn't inflate the numbers, since not all significant strikes have to be shots to the head. In my attempt to overcorrect, I just cut the number in half. And that's 9,271 potential strikes to the head delivered over the course of their careers to various fighters. But just to be safe, let's do even more. And let's only consider a third of the strikes head strikes. That's still 6,180 strikes potentially delivered to the head of various fighters. And unsurprisingly, that's 6,180 strikes too many for anybody's head. And that's not even taken into consideration the blows to the head received from 
fighters and boxers often result in a rapid rotational force, which are thought to be more damaging than linear shots to the head that are often incurred in other sports. So for those of you wondering which sport has the highest likelihood of developing CTE later on in life, unfortunately, it seems to be a showdown between the two communities that I'm involved in in my life, American football and MMA or boxing. Okay. So now let's make a ranking according to the available research in just the combat sports. I'm going to include all the combat sports and martial arts that I came across, but by no means will this include all martial arts. So don't get your panties in a wad if I don't mention your offshoot brand of Jeet Kune Do or what the fuck ever. Okay, so coming in at the bottom is Jiu Jitsu, Judo, Wrestling, Taekwondo, and karate. There may be a few articles out there on these specifically, especially if they were much older, but all I could really find were the incidents of head injury. And remember, TBIs like concussions don't necessarily lead to CTE later on in life. Now, a few reasons why I think this is the case for these martial arts is because oftentimes blows to the head are often accidental or a byproduct of another move, not the main point of the technique. For example, if you get thrown in judo or suplexed in wrestling, you may have some contact of the head on the ground and maybe even some pretty gnarly whiplash. But there aren't many repetitive blows to the head. Not to mention wrestlers have famously strong necks. And we know that the stronger your neck, the lower the likelihood of sustaining a brain injury. And in kind of a weird one like Taekwondo, you're pretty much only worried about kicks, you have headgear, and you can get points in competition by kicking to the body as well. Again, more often than not, in these particular sports, the head is not subjected to repetitive blows. Unsurprisingly, coming in very strongly at the top are MMA fighters and boxers. And we all already went over some of the numbers, but that doesn't even tell the whole story. These figures of the 239 boxer and MMA fighter cohort shows alarming correlations in decreased brain volume and psychomotor scores the longer they participated in their sports. And this is just a reaffirmation of the decades of research that's been performed on boxers since we started to take CTE way more seriously as a scientific and a medical community. So studies have also found that while imaging the brains of UFC fighters that have been diagnosed with a concussion, there were findings similar to the figures that I previously mentioned, with positive signaling in the areas of the brain that are often implicated when diagnosing CTE post-mortem. And in this study, MMA athletes actually had significantly increased levels of tau concentrations as compared to boxers, which I found interesting, suggesting that the unique demands of MMA and boxing may lead to different physiological responses in the brain. And if you don't know what tau is or you've never heard of it, head over to part one of this video series where I explain the role that tau protein plays in CTE. So what exactly do we make of this? If clinicians like myself and others that treat combat athletes are not up to date on these numbers, I would argue that they're borderline negligent. I mean, we are nothing if not our minds and our brains. And while fighting is exhilarating and there's really nothing quite like it, I believe combat athletes need to approach their training scientifically and cautiously. The next video in this series will be all about how to train in order to reduce your risk of brain injury and what to do if you find yourself having some of the symptoms of brain injury or a concussion during your training. Guys, keep training hard, keep training safely, and I'll see you in the next video.